Welcome back to 30 Minutes or Less Podcast. I am your host, Steve, and today we're going to be talking about the Circleville Letters. As always, in the show notes, you can find our link tree and any relevant show links uh, you can find there uh, on Twitter or X. Uh, it's 30 Minutes or Less. And uh, we are in December. It is December 7th. Uh, it has been a little time since the last show. I developed a very serious uh, case of strep throat. Uh, went on for uh, far too long, in my opinion. Uh, but I'm basically uh, good to go now. Also, with the holidays, it's been a terrible time uh, to get sick. And I uh, hid in my basement and uh, watched a lot of NYPD Blue. Um, going through uh, that series Uh, when it was on I watched you know probably fairly frequently not every episode um, and it's been some time so going through and rewatching that but where it's December I rolled out the old Christmas horror uh, list on on uh, letterboxd Uh, you can find that link and uh, in my profile you can find that that list of Christmas horror is your thing Um, now I think I have 72 films in there there's not a a lot of great holiday horror movies uh, but uh, there are some really good ones Uh, so far this year I watched uh, Silent Silent Night Deadly Night the original Uh, that's always a fun time I watched uh, Red Christmas which isn't so great I watched The Leech The Leech I think was a 2022 film I watched it last year and I think it was a new one I watched it last year uh, that's streaming on Arrow uh, I do highly recommend that and then I watched Silent Night Deadly Night Part 2 which again is always a fun time uh, The Leech was a, a new standout uh, holiday horror movie it's not a hardcore horror movie uh, but enough I can put it on the list that and a movie uh, from the UK called um, Silent Night uh, were two new to me ones last year uh, that I really enjoyed. I don't have any new ones yet this year uh, or new to me. So check out the list. Uh, you can find it there. Uh, don't really have anything else, I think, as far as housekeeping goes, so we can get into the story. Now, this is a story that uh, was always uh, intriguing entertaining and uh, just a great mystery and it feels like this is a mystery that um, wouldn't happen today probably Uh, someone would probably do it online Uh, but this very much feels like uh, a story that happens in that time period so Circleville 25 miles from Columbus Ohio you'll find Circleville Small town America with a population of just under 14,000 people. Wikipedia says the city is best known as the host of the Circleville Pumpkin Show, an annual festival held since 1903, but I politely disagree. I only know of Circleville because of its letters. So way back in 1976, many residents in Circleville began receiving anonymous letters from an individual who seemed to know a lot about them. One Circleville resident, however, received more troubling letters. Her name was Mary Gillespie. Uh, She was a school bus driver who was married with children. The letters she began receiving advised her that she and her home were being watched and that the anonymous author was aware of an affair she was having with Gordon Massey, the school superintendent. Very spicy. She was ordered by the letter to stop the alleged affair and that it wasn't a joke. So she received multiple of these letters, and at first she didn't share them with her husband, Ron, and began, uh, you know, keeping a watchful eye, head on a swivel wherever she went, wondering if her new pen pal was near. She kept it hidden until Ron had a letter come addressed for him. In Ron's letter, it told him the affair needed to end or he would die. Mary told her husband there was no affair and they decided to try and ignore the letters. One of the letters read, Gillespie, you have two weeks, you have had two weeks and done nothing. Admit the truth and inform the school board. If not, I will broadcast it on CBS, 
posters, signs, and billboards until the truth comes out. So they put their heads together and began brainstorming on who it could be, and they suspected it was Ron's former brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. So they sent him multiple letters telling him to stop, and for a time, they believed that had scared him off. Things began to return to normal until a phone call on August 19, 1977. No one knows what was said, but Ron answered the phone, and Mary believes that it was their anonymous stalker. Whatever was said on the call caused Ron to become enraged, grab his pistol, and quickly left the house. He didn't get far because he drove his truck into a tree and died. When authorities arrived, they discovered that Ron's gun had been fired once, but they never learned who or what he had fired at. This was deemed as an accident despite the circumstances surrounding Mary and Ron, and it was also disclosed that Ron's blood alcohol level was one and a half times the legal limit. Some people found this strange because people said that he abstained from alcohol. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe allegedly had said there was more to the crash, but later denied making such comments. The letters continued, and now to even more people, and began asking for further investigations as they weren't happy ruling Ron's death as an accident and declared it a cover-up. The letters to Mary Gillespie continued, as well as her immediate family and town officials. The letters contained threats and were vulgar in nature. It was then Mary couldn't keep it secret anymore and admitted to the affair. She did, however, say it was only after the letters began arriving. Ron's brother-in-law was again accused, and Paul Freshour denied it. A former brother-in-law. Uh, which seems strange, um, admitting to the affair and then adding uh, that it only began after the letters. Like, the letters became some kind of a, uh, a good idea. It was a signal that she should begin having an affair. That always sounded uh, strange to me. So, through the scandal and gossip, Mary kept her job driving the school bus. Uh, and six years later, on her route, the mysterious author up the ante, assuming this is the same person. Uh, a sign was posted threatening the life of her daughter, uh, so Mary stopped the bus to go remove the sign. Before she pulled it out, she noticed a box with the string tied to another post. Inside the box was a pistol booby-trapped to fire when the sign was removed and the string was pulled. She reported this to the police, and the serial number was checked, and the gun belonged to Paul Freshour. He again denied writing the letters and said the gun had been missing for quite some time. Also convenient. Uh, the gun was the only evidence the police had, so they were convinced... Oh, sorry, so they convinced Freshour to take a handwriting test. And with the results, the sheriff felt confident uh, and had him arrested for attempted murder. So Paul Freshour went to trial uh, October of 1983. He had an alibi for the day of the booby trap. Um, he was having a lot of work done on his home, and he was present for that, and there were no witnesses seeing him in the area of the trap that day. So despite the alibi, he was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years, and a recommendation he serve at least seven. There wasn't enough evidence to charge him with the letters, but it didn't stop the prosecution from repeatedly bringing them up at the trial. The general consensus of the Circleville residents was that Freshour had authored the letters and attempted to kill Mary, despite some evidence to the contrary or, you know, a reasonable doubt. Now, it didn't help that Paul Freshour's wife, Karen Sue, told the police her husband had written the Circleville letters. Uh, they were in the middle of a very contentious divorce. And Karen Sue also had evidence. Uh, she said she had discovered letters hidden throughout their house. Uh, by all accounts, Fresh Hour was a model prisoner, and amazingly, during his time in prison, hundreds of letters postmarked in Columbus continued to be mailed uh, to Circleville. But they couldn't have been from Fresh Hour because he wasn't serving his sentence in Columbus. And the prison officials housing Fresh Hour didn't believe he was sending the letters because the warden even stated that he couldn't have sent them. He had no access to pens or paper. Despite that, authorities maintained he was still somehow responsible. 
and a little strange, Fresh Hour himself received a letter in prison that read, Now when are you going to believe that you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all. Fast forward uh, to 1994, May. Um, Fresh Hour was released. And a little while after that, Unsolved Mysteries, one of the greatest shows of our time, aired a segment on the Circleville Letters. A few days later, the network got one of their own. It said, Forget Circleville, Ohio. If you come to Ohio, you L. Sickos will pay, the Circleville writer. Now, the reason I really like this story might be that it was on Unsolved Mysteries and it stayed in my brain. Because uh, as a child, so I was 13 at the time when that would have aired, uh, but I watched Unsolved Mysteries all the time as a kid, and I loved it. Uh, those are like core memories, watching Unsolved Mysteries. Um, so anyway, in 2011, Paul Freshour launched a website, circlevilleletters.wordpress.com. If you go there today, it's still up. It has the documents he sent to the FBI, uh, which was also a request for investigating Ron's murder. Um, he did not request them to investigate the crime he was convicted for, but did insist he was innocent. He also accused Sheriff Radcliffe uh, for corruption for the perceived cover-up. Uh, Fresh Hour included a few theories, like that arsenic was being put into the letters, um, that the letters were an attempt to have Superintendent Massey fired, um, that Massey lost his previous gig for improper relations with an employee, that Sheriff Radcliffe was cooking the crime stats to further his career, that Radcliffe was protecting the county coroner from child molestation allegations, and that the DA who, was prose who prosecuted him impregnated a teacher and had her murdered. So that's a, that's a lot. It's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so officially the letters ceased uh, in 1994 uh, when Fresh Hour was released from prison. If you go on Reddit, uh, there's a user uh, Shocker GD um, who reports they continued until 2001. Don't know that that's true, but someone on the internet said it. So, uh, Paul Freshour passed away in 2014 and the Circleville letter writer was never found. Uh, it's estimated in total that there were nearly a thousand letters sent from the writer. There are many theories and questions to this day. So if you go online, um, you can see forums and articles uh, with further details on Fresh Hour's family. Uh, I saw something that they believe that his son Mark might have been responsible. Uh, so there's uh, seemingly no end uh, for this. Officially, the case is closed, uh, but many people believe that the way the investigation was done, uh, including the handwriting tests, uh, weren't legit. Um, and that they were stacked against Paul. So because of all of these uh, rumors and opinions and loose ends, uh, means that it'll probably never really be definitive. And, and that's why it remains an intriguing case. So I recommend going and checking out uh, information on the Circleville letters or even checking out the Unsolved Mysteries uh, segment. I mean, Unsolved Mysteries, I think, is streaming everywhere, so that shouldn't be hard to find. And on the Discord, uh, the show Discord, you can find that in the show notes. I will add some links uh, uh, regarding the Circleville letter writer. And uh, that'll do it for today. Be well. And uh, still don't have a, a catchphrase for the show. Uh, so I guess I'll just say, fuck what you heard, it's what you're hearing. <laughs>